the walls, if you know that one. This has been a pretty fast, consistent rise. And of course, the twist this year was her becoming the nominee. And that is confounding Trump. Democrats have long argued that Donald Trump's policies pull America into the past. Harris, though, now embodies that contrast in a whole new way, rising with this energy and this enthusiasm against an opponent 20 years her senior. Now, I told you we have that Trailblazer special coming up in just moments, but on this breaking news with all of the Trump issues, I want to bring in our political science professor from Fordham University, Christina Greer, the author of Black Ethnics. Uh, welcome. This is how Trump is starting the week. Uh, a lot of those quotes were from people around him. Uh, what do you see in the campaign as we start the week? Well, you know, as you reminded your audience, Ari, it's only been three weeks since Kamala Harris was elevated to the top of the ticket, and it's only been six days since Governor Walz was added to the ticket. And so the momentum is real. The money that's been pouring in is real, and not just big donations, but small donations, which actually can translate into votes because people are feeling invested and excited about this, this new race. It's a new race in many ways. Um, Donald Trump's strategy was, you know, don't vote for the old guy because the black woman might become the president if something happens to him. Well, Joe Biden has stepped aside and now Donald Trump is scrambling for a message, which is she's not that smart. That's not really resonating with a lot of voters who have seen mm. her, not just as the vice president for the past three plus years. She was a senator for several years. She was the attorney general of the largest state in the nation. Um, she's She has a very impressive resume, more impressive than a lot of people who run for the presidency. So his tactics aren't landing. Uh, he's scrambling. And we also know, and you all have talked about this, uh, his choice of vice president is feeling very Sarah Palin-esque, um, you know, is an impulse buy mm, in many wow. ways. And so J.D. Vance isn't adding to the ticket or the base. And so it's one unforced error after another. And we know Donald Trump spirals when when things don't go his way. Well, that's that's tough talk, as you know, Professor, because Palin was viewed as the kind of rare running mate who actually hurt a ticket rather than just being sort of ignored or or, or sort of priced in. She, she was really seen as a drag in the end. Um, but you, you mentioned that contrast with Biden and uh, Peggy Noonan, the former Reagan speechwriter, um, really talk about telling truth to her audience. The Wall Street Journal readers, generally conservative Wall Street types, they've generally rooted for Republicans. But she writes, Harris won her third week in a row. Trump spent most of the week having what a GOP strategist told Politico is a public nervous breakdown. Trump is 78. He hasn't been able to focus or make his case. And she asked the question, is he, in another irony of 2024, turning into Joe Biden? Uh, and Professor Greer, leaving aside the many different reactions people could have to Joe Biden, uh, to her audience, she means that as a political liability. Absolutely. I mean, the, the fundamental difference is Joe Biden loves and cares about this country and Donald Trump loves and only cares about himself. But that being said, you know, many people thought it was just going to be dinosaur versus dinosaur on November 5th. And that's not what we have anymore. And so we have Donald Trump, who lost uh, in 2020. He lost the popular vote in 2016. And I do think, you know, he's a very savvy politician. I will give him that. Uh, but he's he's not disciplined. And so, you know, if he had discipline around him, he would sort of go with more traditional Republican talking points and a traditional way to run against Kamala Harris. That's not something that that is in Donald Trump's wheelhouse. So he is thrown off because his strategy was, I can just sort of talk about Joe Biden and beat him up. And I, I'm the big man and, you know, I can essentially bully my way back into the White House because he knows essentially it's the White House or the big house uh, if he doesn't win. And so now he's completely discombobulated. And as we see more and more independents and weak leaning Republicans move away from his type of rhetoric, I think the downward spiral uh, has occurred. And so sadly, we're going to see a different type of politic and rhetoric from Donald Trump, mm. which will be even more insulting and degrading of the, the office of the presidency. Right. And as you say, as a political scientist, th there are, those are certain patterns. Uh, when down, you want debates. When down by a lot, you do anything to shake it up. You get desperate. You throw mud. Um, and yet there's a lot of signs about how some of that uh, is wearing thin. Uh, Professor Greer, I'd love to talk to you more, but I got these four trailblazers standing by. Uh, Amazing so women. thank you for kicking us off tonight. Absolutely. All right. Anytime. Thank you, Professor. Appreciate it. Uh, as mentioned, we, we have always the daily news. We started with your campaign update. But beyond that, there's something larger that's been happening. A lot of people clearly feel it. Maybe you do, too. The White House color line, which first fell. New reporting from inside the Trump campaign highlights a Donald Trump, who is obviously rattled by a series of events, 
which due in large part to his inability to adapt or accept, now find him trailing in several key battleground states, a scenario seemingly unimaginable one month ago. From that New York Times reporting, Trump has been whipsawed by a seven-week roller coaster ride of events, an attempt on his life, the selection of a running mate, a nominating convention, his opponent's withdrawal from the race, the entry of a galvanizing new rival, a potential Iranian assassination threat against him, and new layers of security that have brought a bunker-like feel to his properties, more than at any time since he was in the White House. And rather than adapt to changing circumstances, Trump has chosen to ignore most campaign advice and lash out questioning his opponent's ethnicity, delivering incoherent and unhinged press conferences from Mar-a-Lago, and crying about the size of Vice President Kamala Harris's crowds at her rallies. Now his campaign is worried about carrying even in the state where his running mate serves as senator. Quote, two private polls conducted in Ohio recently by Republican pollster show Donald Trump receiving less than 50 percent against Ms. Harris in the state, according to a person with direct knowledge of the data. Ohio, not Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin. They are now worried about Ohio. Joining our conversation, editor for The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com, Chris Quinn is back with us. Eddie and Claire are here. When I saw this reporting in The New York Times, I thought about your reporting and the things you've shared on this program. I thought of you instantly, and I'm so happy to have you. Um, Do you think they're going to be looking over their shoulder in Ohio, Chris? I hope so. But I do have to say this is a rabbit hole that I fear to go down. The last two elections, all the polling showed it was close and we reported it. We participated with Baldwin Wallace University in the polling and it all turned out to be way off. He won by eight points both times. We've stopped reporting polls. Baldwin Wallace has stopped doing horse race polls because they're so unreliable. I say all that, though, as somebody who lives in this state and has been here for 28 years, Um, And I do think this is not a state that embraces the hateful invective you get from Donald Trump. You just had a conversation before the break about the exuberance and the joy you're seeing in the Democratic ticket. And after eight years of all this anger, I do get the sense Ohio is tired of all of that, does want to like their candidates again. They're decent people who live here. So I'm in a small minority of of people who watch it in Ohio who think it could happen, but I would never base it on polls because they've been so wrong for so long. Well, and Chris, I know from working on campaigns that sometimes it's not that you necessarily think you're going to lose a state. It's that you have to go and protect it. And I think some of what so my guess after reading this reporting is that the Trump campaign is polling in Ohio to protect it. And that, too, is a political expense. When you have to spend time in Ohio, you can't spend time in Nevada or Pennsylvania. When you have to make a trip to Texas to make sure you don't embarrass yourself, you're not spending your time in the battlegrounds. And, and I wondered if, if that was part of it. I think the other thing is what we, what we keep talking to you about, and that's J.D. Vance. I mean, he is so unlikable. He is so so extreme. You've got Donald Trump saying, oh, they're not they're not labeling me weird. They're labeling J.D. Vance weird. He doesn't have a, a defender anywhere. We don't see J.D. Vance a lot in Ohio. He's everywhere uh, mm. else but Ohio. You know, it's interesting you say about coming here to guard it, because we've been talking about doing a story saying for the first time in many decades and all of our lifetimes, Ohio doesn't matter. That, that no one will come here. We won't get the advertising. We've been bombarded by all the visits and the advertising for years. And based on what you're saying, we might, we might still see that, which would be interesting. The other factor, I got to tell you, the one that I'm not understanding, Sherrod Brown is in a tight battle to hold his seat in the Senate. Polls are showing he's up and, and he should win because people like him. But I just I want to move on to uh, something that Governor Walls has called you and Donald Trump, and that is weird. Sure. And it is taken off. The New York Times reports that when Donald Trump was asked about it, he said, not me. They're talking about J.D. Well, certainly they've levied that charge against me more than anybody else, but I think Folks, one thing I want you to do is smash that subscribe button and hit that like button because what we're doing today is covering the collapse of the friendship relationship of 
Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, and Trump is cursing out Vance right now, blaming him for everything. Now, I want to be clear. Vance is a terrible candidate, and what he said before his selection during this campaign and what he's going to continue to do is going to make Donald Trump's chance of victory that much smaller. Trump deserves the lion's share of the blame, but Vance isn't helping. But again, the only reason Vance is... The topic du jour, the person we're talking about, is because Trump the dum-dum picked him. He could have picked any number of regular Republicans. He could have swallowed his pride and picked Nikki Haley, and he'd be in a much better position, or Doug Burgum, and he'd be in a much better position. Even somebody like Rubio or Tim Scott, he'd be in a better position. But no, he picked Vance, and now he's going to blame Vance, and you can already see it. Because right now, they're worried about losing Ohio. Ohio hasn't really been competitive since the Obama days. It's getting more and more red. Uh, this the nature of the state. It's deindustrializing. So many of the good union jobs aren't there quite like they used to be. And the state's becoming more and more like a Indiana and less and less like a Pennsylvania or a Michigan. And that makes it harder for Democrats to win, although not impossible. And the whole point of picking a VP is that they balance the ticket and they give you at the very least a chance to win their home state. And if the state is already in your, in your, in your list to really lock it up. So the whole point of picking Vance was, Oh, he's a populist that working class people are going to like. And yes, he's not from one of the swing States, but he's close to Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. He will play good in that region broadly defined, not just his state, but the surrounding states. But not only is he failing to make inroads in those three key states, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, he is also failing, guys, to win his own state. And you can even see it here that Trump is losing his mind and he's even blaming Vance for the weird stuff. He's screaming at Vance being like, no, you're the one who's weird. No one ever called me weird before. Of course we did, but no one ever called me weird until you came along. Now they're calling you weird and I'm getting smeared with the weird paintbrush. So keep an eye on this, guys. You're going to hear more and more behind the scenes leaks of Donald Trump yelling at Vance and cursing him out, blaming him for his own failures.